Thank you for joining us for Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson. We have a really good show today, and I know you'll want to hear the story that we've brought forward. We're following up on an earlier broadcast we did about the Oklahoma City bombing. Just to remind those of you who maybe are not familiar with that, it's uh, before your time or you just don't remember the details. It happened right here in Oklahoma City. That's where Prophecy in the News uh, is headquartered and broadcast from. It happened on April 19th, 1995, a Wednesday morning. I still remember that day myself. I was pastoring across our state in another city, but how well we remember the shocking news. And I grew up in Oklahoma City, so I had a lot of concern about people that I knew here. In an earlier program, we had Chris Emery with us. He is the producer of three Christian documentaries. One is called The Noble Lie, specifically about the Oklahoma City bombing. And in that documentary, he brings forward the evidence and the reasons for believing that the government has been less than forthright in what they've told us about the cause. We've already discussed the fact that beyond the two suspects who were known, there were another 12 to 18 uh, people that could have been involved, that there seems to be signs of a more sophisticated operation than just a truck full of fertilizer blowing up as planned. And so today we're bringing forward a very special guest. Uh, she's been interviewed over 580 times on international, national, and local media with her story. This is a very real personal story for her because she lost uh, loved ones in this bombing and she had questions that she couldn't seem to get right and answer in her own mind. She also has an epic story of the Lord's power to forgive. And I hope to bring all of that to you in these next few moments. So I hope you'll stay right there with us. And let me begin by reintroducing Chris Emery. Chris, uh, just to say hello again. Thank you for having me back. You Appreciate also it. did Shadow Ring and State of Mind, and those are some great documentaries about uh, globalism and our economy and kind of how they try to manipulate the, the public opinion. Mm -hmm. But all of those kind of spun off this original singular project That's that correct. raised your interest when uh, you lived in Oklahoma City for several years, and uh, you, you just found that all the pieces weren't adding up. And, and uh, just to revisit that for a moment, mm -hmm. and then we'll get to Janie. Yes, uh, the movie uh, is basically an academic approach to the unanswered questions about the bombing. Based on um, solid documentation, evidence, uh, blueprints, video, uh, testimony, uh, um, photographs, uh, video footage taken from the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department, uh, over eight and a half years of work encapsulated, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very proud to have been given awards for the film. Two-hour documentary? Coming in at two hours, eight seconds. Well, I know you spoke uh, to a lot of law enforcement, government agents, uh, even people in the judicial area when you made this documentary. But one of your real interesting pieces came from the woman we're going to interview, Janie. Janie Coverdale, we want to say hello. Welcome to you. Hi. Thank you. You're a Virginian and a proud Virginian, but you lived in Oklahoma a long time. Yes. And uh, you were touched by this. And, and maybe you could tell how you two met. Uh, it's quite a fascinating story. Jenny, go ahead. I think you better do it because my brain isn't working too big. <laughs> <laughs> Just in a, in a nutshell, back in March of 2004 was the start of the Terry Nichols state trial. Terry he was, was one, one, of the the two one of the two suspects brought forward. Correct, on the official narrative. Mm, in the official narrative. Um, he and Timothy McVeigh. That's correct. Terry had already been tried and convicted uh, on eight counts of uh, uh, match slaughter. Uh, for the eight uh, federal employees in the, the bombing. He was serving time at uh, the Supermax in Florence, Colorado, outside of Denver. And there were a number of people, including Janie, that uh, had uh, asked both the Attorney General and the District Attorney's Office here in Oklahoma County to bring forward a state trial so he could be tried on 160 counts of murder, mm -hmm. the remaining number of victims in the bombing. So um, I believe it was about a week or two before the trial started which was actually seated at the Pittsburgh County Courthouse. Um, McAllister, uh, Oklahoma. In McAllister, yeah. Judge uh, Stephen Jones, who is now on the Oklahoma Supreme Court, presided over the trial. And uh, George Wallace, who is a member of the Oklahoma S uh, Bombing Investigation Committee, one of the four members that authored that book that I gave you in another uh, interview we had. Uh, mutual friend. Um, George had introduced me to Janie, and uh, we've known each other since then. Oh, a strong friendship. Yes, sometimes I feel like I'm his mother. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you've been that way to a lot of young men as far as that God's let you have help in raising and teaching. And 
by me having all boys, uh, I gave birth to four sons, and we were military. Mm -hmm. And so I just always had a house full of boys. They would leave home and move in with us. Yeah. So I have a lot of young men that calls me mama. Well, that's special. <laughs> it really is. Yes. Well, you actually, in 1995, I believe, told me you lived in downtown Oklahoma City and worked downtown. I did. You were very close to the bombing that morning, and obviously tell us your story. Okay, I was living that, after I came back from Denver, from uh, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols' trials, I moved back into Regency, and um, I was... Um, I was working at the um, at the city hall. Let me back up some. I had custody of Aaron and Elijah, mm -hmm. and uh, so these are your grandsons. They were my grandsons. They were my third son's children, mm -hmm. and uh, I had put them in a daycare center in the federal building because it was so convenient for me to drop them off at the daycare center and walk home to work because I worked at City Hall. Right. And that Wednesday morning, for some reason, I started to stay home. I got up late and I didn't want to go to work, but mm. I had stayed off, I had taken that Monday off, so I decided I needed to go to work that Wednesday. So I dropped the boys off at the daycare center and I went on to work. And hadn't been there very long when I heard the explosion. Mm. And uh, I didn't know what it was. I was walking down the hallway. I was on a medication that I had to have, take with food. So I had gone down and gotten a croissant and was walking down the hallway and I heard the explosion. And I didn't know what it was. and. All of a sudden, I heard somebody say, we need to vacate the building. Mm. And when I ran outside and looked up the street, I saw a lot of smoke. Well, I thought it was the Regency was on fire again because it had been on fire a few years before then. And I remember asking, is it the Regency? And this voice in the back of me said, no, it's the federal building. And I said, I got to go. Mm. I left the boys mm. there mm. this morning. So some of my co-workers took off with me and we got to the federal building and on the fourth street side. You didn't, it didn't look like too much damage had been done. And uh, then for some reason I walked around to the fifth street side and the yeah. building wasn't there. So you were on the south side I was and on you the couldn't south really side. see all the no. damage. Yeah. And I went to the north side and the, the building was gone. That's where the daycare center had been was nothing there and I remember screaming and uh, I saw him bringing people out of the building and I but I didn't see Aaron and Elijah and they were how old Aaron was five and Elijah was two mm. and uh, so then I uh, I went to, um, I went up to Children's Hospital. Cause first we went to different hospitals to see if, if maybe they had already been. Brought there. Uh -huh. And you we just couldn't didn't know. There was probably a lot of confusion, wasn't there? It was. And I went to uh, Children's Hospital and I saw a couple of kids that had been in the daycare center, but not Aaron and Elijah. This was Wednesday. And mm -hmm. that uh, we ended up at uh, First Christian Church, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of reporters and all there. It was right downtown nearby. It's close, yeah. And so um, when I got ready to leave First Christian Church that Wednesday night, I ran into m one of my son's mother-in-law. And she, my son was, uh, was living in Kansas at that time, and he had called her and asked her to find me and take me home with her. So uh, when I ran into her, she said, come on, Jeff, want me to take you home with me. So I spent the night with her, got up that Thursday morning to go home. 
Well, I went home. I thought I had a home, but I didn't. Went home to change clothes, and I didn't have a home either. Mm -hmm. So um, we went on back out to First Christian Church, and I did that every day uh, through Saturday, late that Saturday evening. Still no word about the boys. I didn't know where the boys were. I had tried the hospitals. I had tried everybody. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where they were until late that Saturday evening. And they told us that they had identified their bodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, things just haven't been the same since then. No, they couldn't be. I, uh, <laughs> I lived in a motel room for six months. But I was still asking questions. You know, uh, things weren't making sense. What was leading you to think that things weren't adding up? Well, they kept saying that uh, Timothy McVeigh had uh, blown up the federal building. At first they said Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, but mm -hmm. then I found out Terry Nichols wasn't even in Oklahoma that day. Mm. He didn't come here. And I couldn't see Timothy McVeigh doing all of that damage himself. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just kept asking questions. I wanted to know what happened. Who were you taking your questions to? Did Anybody that came uh, that I could ask. I saw FBI agents. Mm -hmm. I saw policemen. Whoever with authority I asked. And, uh, but they weren't answering my questions. Nobody could tell me. <laughs> why that building was blown up. So, um, like I said, I lived at the Regency. So I went, at, at the Regency, there was a convenience store on the first floor. And I went in there one morning, I was talking to Danny Wilkerson. If I may interject real quick, sure, as we sure. highlight in the film, the Regency is literally less than a, a block f to the west and across the street from where the mirror building stood. Right. So it sustained an enormous amount of damage because of the concussion blast. So from close, right. Yeah. And again, the detonation experts playing off our earlier interview, mm. our one of the experts said there's no way that yeah. that truck could have done that amount of damage. No. So you've mm. got questions and you're trying to understand and nobody's giving you an answer. And no, they weren't giving me any answers and I was talking to other people that had seen things and they what they saw wasn't what we were told. Mm. I... Uh, like I said, I went to the Regency, and uh, Danny Wilkerson owned the uh, convenience store. And he said, uh, Timothy McVeigh was here that Wednesday morning. And I said, he was? He said, yeah. He said he came in and he bought two Cokes and a pack of Marlboro cigarettes. Mm. Well, I had heard that Tim didn't smoke. So why was he buying cigarettes? Mm -hmm. And I asked Danny, I said, uh, where was the rider truck parked? He said, right here in front of the door. I said, was there anybody else in the truck? He said, yeah. There was another man in the truck. Well, nobody told us that either. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that uh, he and Tim talked for a while and he got busy in the store. When he looked up again, the truck was gone. Truck came back and parked across the street. We've seen uh, videos of that. Truck was parked across the street and Tim got out of the truck right. and went around to the back of the truck. But that second person wasn't in the truck then. Mm. Okay. Another question I had is they kept saying that Tim left his, that yellow Mercury parked across the street in, in, in that in way over in that parking lot. Well, when I got up to the building that Wednesday morning, all those cars were on fire. Hmm. So I was wondering now, how did Tim's car didn't burn up? When the rest of them were burning up, they were on fire when I got there. And so what we figured is that Tim went up, dropped that person off, that person went in that parking lot and drove that car out of the parking lot before the bomb went off. Before the bomb went off. And mm -hmm. when I approached uh, 
from agents about that. They looked at me like I was crazy. Nobody would listen. Mm. Nobody would tell me the truth. And I just, I wanted to know who killed those kids. I knew 15 of those children up that, w that died that day. Mm. It's a lot of children. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to know who killed them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like I said, Terry Nichols didn't come to Oklahoma City that day. Mm -hmm. So we know he didn't blow up the building. Well, let me just uh, take your piece here and, and direct it to Chris a minute and say when you met and you mm -hmm. heard that, how did that fit or comport with what you were already finding out? Uh, oddly enough, I had uh, read a, a couple of Janie's interviews in the newspapers and had photo op uh, with that. And when I entered, uh, was introduced to her, I thought, wow, I'm uh, hitting the pay dirt here as far as the source of credible information. And it uh, dovetailed perfectly with the intel we were getting from um, people that were down there shopping or some of the survivors. So we put her on the short list of the, the people we wanted to interview in the film, not only because was she comfortable on the camera, but her story, it was unimpeachable, mm -hmm. solid as, as rock. And so we worked her into the, the script and the narrative of the, the film, not only to show credibility, but that this is actually um, we're not talking just a body count. We're talking about human beings here, people that right. were affected, you know, and living less than a block from the, the building. What she told us and the timing of, of the other testimony we got just helped us put the pieces of the puzzle together. And we're very honored to have her in the film. Yeah, fascinating. Yes, and she is in this video. And that might be a good time for me to just, again, to you that are watching today, uh, we're talking with uh, Chris Emery, the producer of A Noble Lie, which is about the Oklahoma City bombing and uh, really some other thoughts than the official version of what happened that day and included in the documentary and our guest here in the studio at Prophecy in the News, Janie Coverdale. And uh, we're gonna talk with her a moment more about a personal side of this, but if you'd like to get this, uh, it's, it's fascinating, it's two hours long, but we're offering this through our bookstore or calling the 800 number on your screen. It's uh, 1995 plus shipping and handling. And you know, Chris has also made State of Mind, which is about the psychology of control, manipulating public opinion, which really plays off of this. And then coming off State of Mind, uh, he's got one called Shadow Ring that is really about more of a global uh, takeover uh, to bring the world under one government. And uh, that's fascinating material. It's not just uh, theories, it's actually all documented. It's approached academically. It's approached with uh, critical thinking and you can get all three together in a bundle for uh, $49.95 plus shipping and handling. But that's enough for, for offering that. Uh, I'd like to come, if I may, Janie, to the fact that when you two met, you were traveling all the way to Denver for Terry Nichols' trial. And why did you do that? I went, I attended Tim's trial and Terry Nichols' trial. You went to Tim's as well? Yes. and. Uh, what I did was I went to Denver to Tim's trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, when his trial was over, I came back to Oklahoma City, gave up my apartment, put my furniture in storage, and went back to Denver for Tim, uh, Terry Nichols' trial. I thought some answers, I was gonna get some answers. So you're still at looking. At the trial, I was, still, I, I was still confused. The heart's longing. I couldn't, I, I, I just, didn't believe what we had been told. I still don't believe what we've been told. And uh, I thought maybe I could get my answers there. And that's why I went. And some nice man in Boston had seen me on TV. Mm -hmm. And I went to a hearing here at the federal courthouse. And this reporter came up to me and said, Janie, here, uh, here's a man's name and phone number. He wants you to call him. So I called him. He paid all of my expenses. Wow. Every time I went to Denver, uh, he, well, he, he, when he found out there was a hearing in Denver, he'd call me and say, uh, I hear that they're having a hearing in Denver. And I'd say, yeah. And he'd ask me, do you want to go? And I'd say, yeah, I'd love to go. How much money do you need? Finally, I said, now, you don't ask women how much <laughs> money they need. <laughs> 
because they just don't print that amount. I was going to say, that's a bottomless <laughs> pit. <laughs> that's a black hole. <laughs> you just send me whatever you want to send me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but anyway, I have never met this man. I talked to him over the phone, but never wow. met him. But he paid my expenses. That's why I was able to go back and forth. A kind benefactor and a blessing. You know, God has a way of getting things to our lives sometimes. Yes, right. God bless that man. And uh, believe it or not, I sat with T Terry Nichols' mother mm -hmm. in Denver in the courtroom. And I felt so sorry for that lady. Mm. You know, that was her son. Yes. And she was there. And nobody wanted to have anything to do with her. And I admired her because she she's a strong lady. To sit in that courtroom almost by herself for her son's trial. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when uh, Terry's trial was over and we came back to Oklahoma, I wasn't satisfied. At first, I wanted Terry to get the death penalty too. But then one morning I was asleep and this voice told me there's been enough killings. And I knew who was talking to me. Mm -hmm. And I was glad Terry didn't get the death penalty. I was just angry because, like I've said over and over and over, Terry's not half as guilty as the government has said he was. Because yeah. he was not here. <coughs> he did not help blow up that building. But he's doing all of those life sentences anyway. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's fair either. But, um... You know, I think about my boys a lot and wonder what they would be doing now. They'd be oh, wow. men. Yeah, they'd be in their 20s now. Yeah. Hmm. And we still don't know the answers. We still don't know who murdered those people. And I feel like we have a right to know. Mm -hmm. They were our loved ones. And I talked to a lot of federal agents in Denver and here, and I still haven't gotten my answers. Well, I think I heard you say you also went to Timothy McVeigh's trial. Yes, I attended Timothy McVeigh's trial, all of it. Did you meet any family of his or talk with anyone that knew him very well? No, I didn't. I, um, Tim's trial was a little different than Terry's trial. Mm -hmm. Terry's family all except one brother, were very, very nice to me. Uh, Tim's family sort of stayed away. They didn't have anything to do with me. But uh, Terry's sister would hug me, and Terry has one brother less. He's the sweetest person I've ever met. And uh, I did, and I'm skipping ahead, Mm -hmm. Here, uh, for the 20th anniversary, I did an interview, and I, I, I think it was, it was the one I did with Associated Press. And there was a picture of me and a picture of Mr. McVeigh, Tim's dad. Uh. And uh, Mr. McVeigh was about the saddest person I had ever seen. I cried when I saw his picture. And uh, I called this reporter in Buffalo, New York and told him I wanted to write Mr. McVeigh a letter and asked him he, if he thought it would be okay. And he said, just write the letter and send it to him. He'd make sure Mr. McVeigh got it. I haven't heard back from Mr. McVeigh, which I didn't intend to. I didn't expect to. But you sent the letter. But I sent the letter and I, because what I wanted to, I was telling him is don't feel guilty for what your grown son did. You had no control over him. You taught him mm. right from wrong when he was a little boy. But when our kids get grown, they do their own thing. They make their decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of parents uh, need that reminder sometimes. And, uh, well, you found from God the grace to forgive, didn't you? Yes, because uh, the first person was Terry Nichols. You know, Chris, I asked Chris to get me Terry's address. And, Chris, uh, and Terry was still in McAllister at that time. And Chris got the address for me. And I wrote Terry. And uh, I 
said, uh, since God has seen fit to spare your life again, mm -hmm. I think it's time for you to tell us what happened. And I didn't expect to hear back from Terry because I, what I had heard that they were racist and mm -hmm. government, well, government hated racists and mm -hmm. all. But he wrote me. Mm -hmm. And he said, for all the pain and suffering I've caused you and your family, please forgive me. Mm. And I knew I had to forgive him. Mm -hmm. And Terry and I have been writing all of these years. Pen pals. Yeah. <laughs> I've read several of those letters. It's really heartening. Uh, we're dealing with a human being here with yeah. a heart, with a mind, with a conscience. And uh, it's, I mean, it's just priceless <laughs> to look into that part of history and... Uh, Thank the Lord he's still alive, even though he's incarcerated, we could still communicate with him. You know, this is, this is the key point of it all, because human sin and suffering is kind of like a, a big pile of trash, just like a big garbage mound. And yet somehow there's a flower, a rose growing out of it. And that seems to be what the Lord gave us when he sent Jesus to give his life on the cross and rise for us and you can have that grace and forgiveness. And, you know, this side of eternity, we may not get all of our questions answered, but we can rest in the Lord. And we can know that he's going to take care of us. And I've no doubt that those two little boys were in Jesus' arms instantly. And they've, they've been waiting for Grandma. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't lessen your loss, but the Lord is good. And uh, we know that we can be together in him in this situation. And, you know, I... Um I was so angry until I did forgive Terry. Mm -hmm. And all of my anger just disappeared. Amen. I, I wasn't angry anymore. And Chris can tell you, I was very angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And understandable. I had never felt that way about anybody. And all of a sudden, here are these two men, and I just I almost hated them. And God let you forgive. And now once I forgave Amen. them, and, and Aaron and Elijah's dad, that's my third son, he, he wrote me, and I think he was living in Florida then, and he said, Mama, tell Terry that I'm not angry with him and Tim anymore. Wow. And that made me feel good. Well, amen. Well, God bless you for such a marvelous story, and let me just uh, take it from there and say that the word forgive, as you found out, it means to let go, to release, to walk away from. And maybe someone is watching today that needs to forgive someone, something that's hurt you. You can find the strength and the grace in the Lord to do that, but you need to know Christ yourself and you need to go to the cross and find his love there to forgive others. Till then, we are looking for Jesus to come back. Thank you for being with us. Keep looking up. <laughs>